Okay, so let's consider a, a typical muscle. It has extrafusal fibers, and then it has these muscle spindles that have intrafusal fibers. And let's consider that, that they're at a resting length, and then along comes a contraction, and the extrafusal fibers are going to shorten. So let's say they shorten. And if they shorten and the intrafusal fiber is, is not shortened, then it's going to become lax. So it's much longer than this. Now what happens if, if a stretch comes along? If I now stretch this, intrafusal fiber could care less. It cannot signal that stretch. That's not good. And the nervous system is not going to tolerate that kind of uh, slop. So what happens instead is that when, so th this does not happen. Instead, what we get is called um, alpha gamma coactivation. And that means nothing to you, but it's going to mean something to you in one second. And what happens is that as the extrafusal fibers contract, so does the intrafusal fiber. Okay? And it contracts because the polar regions contract. So now, if a, if a stretch comes along now, this intrafusal fiber is now going to be informative. It will be stretched, and it will give us information. Great. How did we get that? Well, we got that through alpha-gamma co coactivation. Alpha and gamma refer to two different types of motor neurons. Alpha motor neurons and gamma motor neurons. Gamma motor neurons. And the alpha motor neurons innervate uh, extrafusal fibers. They're the ones that we talked about. Those are the motor units. And then the gamma motor neurons innervate intrafusal fibers in the same muscle. Okay? And when, they, when I say that they innervate intrafusal fibers, I mean that if this is an intrafusal fiber and these two red areas are the polar regions, this is the equatorial region, if the red regions are contracted because of gamma motor neuron activation, then this equatorial region will be stretched. Okay? So they will be contracted. So that at all times, Information is given, the same information is given to alpha motor neurons and gamma motor neurons. And what that does is it enables your, your feedback system, your how much is my, is my muscle being stretched by an external load. Um, it enables that system to always be online. Now, what is the stimulus that's going to excite um, the, the stretch reflex, that's going to excite the 1A reflex? And the stretch and the stimulus is a load. In other words, you can think about it. I'm, sta I'm standing here. I'm holding a, a, a cup, and somebody pours water into the cup. That is a load. If I don't repose that, oppose that increased uh, weight in the cup, my arm is going to drop. The water is going to pour out. Okay. So I have to be able to sense that, and I sense that through the lengthening of my muscles. Another example where that happens is if you're walking along and your foot strikes something that is going to lengthen, uh, it's going to lengthen muscles that, that are involved in flexing your foot. So the, the, flexing, the flexors will be lengthened and that will elicit, that will um, engage a stumbling reflex. Okay, so alpha gamma coactivation is the rule. And now what we're going to do is we're going to consider a possibility where we start with a gamma motor neuron activation. And this is called the gamma loop. So let's just imagine that a gamma motor neuron was zapped. This is excited. So we're going to excite this cell. And the result of that excitation is that the uh, intrafusal fiber, the polar regions are contracted, and that stretches this equatorial region. 
So now, if we have a, um, a 1A afferent that is wrapped up here, now that 1A afferent is stretched. And so the 1A afferent is now excited. That's excited. And what does that 1A afferent do? It comes into the spinal cord where it talks to a motor neuron. And that motor neuron goes back out to innervate an extrafusal fiber in the same muscle. So now, what have you done? By stimulating the gamma motor neuron, you have ended up with a contraction, a visible contraction of that muscle. All right? So that's the gamma loop. Now, I wouldn't be talking about that if it didn't occur. It does occur. It, occur the, the, um, it occurs primarily because, uh, primarily from certain sources, and the primary one that, uh, that uh, is responsible for exciting gamma motor neurons is, uh, um, comes from the cerebellum, not directly, but indirectly. So the cerebellum is very important in uh, setting the gamma motor neuron tone, and it, 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 it can contract these. And, and if you don't have that, what would be the result? There would be, the result would be less contraction of the extrafusal uh, fibers and less muscle tone. So one of the consequences of, sp of cerebellar disorders is floppiness, floppy muscles. Muscles that are, are, don't have that much, that have a, a lower than um, typical uh, tone. Now, why, why might we have a way for engaging this gamma loop? Well, it, when you engage the gamma loop, you're, you're essentially sensitizing the stretch reflex. Let's say that at normal circumstances, uh, I, I need five grams of weight uh, in order to, to respond to a stretch. So we, I need a load of, of five grams in order to elicit a stretch reflex. Now, if I'm walking on a tight rope, I may want to be a little more sensitive to uh, perturbations in my muscles. I may want, if, if I'm walking on a tight rope, uh, I want to be much more sensitive to if, if my legs are starting to slip or my, my foot starts to uh, uh, extend or, or flex because I'm falling off. And so I may want to be sensitive to, say, one gram. And this type of modulation in, uh, allows me to change the sensitivity of the 1A reflex. And in general, the 1A reflex is going to be more, uh, it, it, there's going to be more sensitivity in situations of finely controlled motor units. So and a typical example, we're, we're recording here in the summertime, but um, in the wintertime in Chicago, you engage, you, you heighten your sensitivity of your 1A reflex all the time to walk on ice. Okay? So if we think about the gain of the 1A reflex, we can think about the output over the input. So this is the, um, the contraction over the stretch. Now, if this were a perfect world, if the 1A reflex were, were absolutely uh, 100% accurate, it would be, it would be 1.0. Every stretch would be opposed by a perfect contraction that undid that stretch. The, the gain of the 1A reflex is, is nowhere near 1.0 under normal circumstances. But under specific circumstances, it can be, um, uh, it, it can be closer to that. Okay. The final point about stretch reflex is where is it the most important? It's the most important in the thing that we terrestrial animals have to deal with all the time. I mean, all animals, marine animals have to deal with gravity too, but gravity is a much uh, uh, more um, problematic force in our lives than in, in the lives of aquatic animals. So what we, how do we 
deal with gravity, we use what are called physiological extensors. Physiological extensors are um, muscles that oppose gravity, okay? So uh, typically you think about a flexor as something that decreases the joint angle and an extensor as one that increases the joint angle. Well, a physiological extensor and a physiological flexor aren't defined by joint angle, they're defined by what they do with respect to gravity. So, a physiological extensor opposes gravity, a physiological flexor works with gravity. So in the arms, this is a, a, the biceps, which is a joint flexor, is a physiological extensor. It opposes gravity. Another example is in the jaw. The jaw closing closes the joint angle, but it is opposing gravity. So it is a physiological extensor. The 1A reflex is strongest in all of the physiological extensors. These, the, the muscles in your legs that keep you upright, the muscles in your back, and the muscles in your neck, and also jaw closers. So when you're standing there, you're, you, when you're at rest, your jaw tends to be closed because you have this activity in your physiological extensors. And that is going to be very sensitive to, uh, to any stretch. So you, you continue to oppose gravity uh, well. Okay, so in the next uh, video, I'm going to give you an assignment that's going to allow you to work through uh, a, a series of clinical tests and understand what the uh, outcome of, that, of those tests uh, should be.